I don't even think I can top that introduction. I, so, uh, can everybody hear me okay? That's, that's good. Um, huh. Okay, so this talk is a backbone to discuss a post-mortem. Um, basically, um, just want to talk about a project we did last year in which we converted the Discuss application to use Backbone. Um, and not just that, we did like a complete kind of like client-side re-architecture. Re so I'm going to talk about that um, and explain what Discuss is and why we did it and all that. Um, and just to start off, just want to, you know, some people some people don't like the word postmortem because it's death and it's like I'm doing an autopsy or something. But technically speaking, in the dictionary, it's analysis or discussion of an event after it's over. Just want to get that out of the way before people are upset about it. Um, so uh, just a little bit about me. Um, earlier this year, I released a book uh, with my co-author, Anton Kovyev. He's the JS Hint guy. Um, I don't have a guy thing, so I'm just Ben. Um, but we put out this book, and um, it's about um, building third-party widgets, writing JavaScript code that goes on other people's websites, how to make it you know, not break and stuff like that. Um, it's a pretty good book. Uh, you should check out the Amazon reviews because they're very insightful and, and they may convince you to purchase the book. Um, and there's some, you know, there's some, there's some legit people out there who, who've said some nice things. Rebecca Murphy was a speaker last year, I understand. So you know, just based on 45 pages, I think that's pretty good. Um, she recanted everything, 60 pages in. Um, so I'm not here really too much to talk about the book, although uh, definitely some of the stuff is related. Uh, so I work at Discuss, and that's Discuss, like discussion, not Discuss. I'd say it's about a 50-50 split that people say one or the other. Um, and once you hear Discuss, you're like, oh, that makes sense. Why didn't I think of that? Don't worry about it. Now you know. Um, so what we do is we do like a conversation platform embedded commenting thing. Uh, we're all over the web. Um, a lot of big sites, a lot of small sites. Lately, I'm kind of more amped up about some of the like non-traditional uses of Discuss that really get me excited. Uh, this is, we're actually on the Redis documentation. So this is just um, a page, it's the expire command, and there's just, you know, there's a legitimate conversation taking place at the bottom about how to use the command and people are participating, and I think that's pretty cool. So um, how Discuss actually gets on your page, if, you don't know is it's it's a third-party script. You put this snippet, kind of like a Google Analytics snippet that everybody's seen. You put it on your web page. You sign up on our website, and you get um, comments on your website. So just you know, quick recap. Uh, we're on a lot of big sites as well. I showed the Redis documentation, but we also do comments for CNN, Wired, IGN, Rolling Stone, NPR. Um, it's a it's a big list. Uh, also the Ruby on Rails blog. Um, rubydop.org, stuff like that. Um, a lot of personal blogs, etc. Just some obligatory, obligatory fancy stats. We do about a billion uniques a month right now. That's like Google's um, measure of a unique. Um, which would put us in like the top 10 sites overall if we were just a destination site, so that's kind of crazy. Um, we get almost a million comments a day, but that's just comments. We also have a lot of other events that are taking place. There's votes, there's favoriting things and sharing things. There's a lot of stuff that's happening. Um, and we also have a real-time service that, that's new, and it was part of what we built in the last year. And um, on any normal day, we get about 3 million active connections. Um, and then my last stat is that there's 16 of us that are building this, um, which I think is pretty cool. Um, apparently 18 today, I got an email because we hired a bunch of people. Uh, and then lastly, um, I just thought this was neat because I'm here. Um, Discuss was a YCO7 company. At the time, it was in Cambridge. So probably just a couple blocks from here. I actually only just learned that a couple months ago, so it's kind of neat. All right, so that, that's like Discuss today. That's kind of what we're doing today. But I want to I wanna bring you back in the time machine. And we're going to set the time machine back one year. <laughs> that's, that's the most interesting time you would go to if you had a time machine. Uh, <laughs> um, so, or two years, um, year and a half. Um, so in 2011, Discuss kind of looked a little, little different. We were, we were trying to do this like software as a service thing. Oh, S-A-A-S, not S-A-S-S. Um, we could be both, I don't know. Um, and, and it was the kind of thing like you went to our website, we had a free service, but you could go to the website and there'd be that familiar like choose a plan, $20 a month, $50 a month, $100 a month. 
And depending on what you got, you got access to different stuff. Uh, analytics, a theming thing, a template editor. Um, and also the, the application was really customizable. Like anybody could just write CSS, target some stuff, make it look different. It was like, it was like your comments. Um, and, and that worked really well, and we were, we were getting really big really fast, and a lot of people were using us, and they were pretty happy. But um, things started kind of like snowballing and getting out of control for us. Um, for starters, when everybody can customize Discuss, um, it starts to look different everywhere, and then people don't really know what Discuss is anymore. Um, they take off our, it could be as simple as just taking off our branding, or just completely eliminating a feature, or whatever. Um, People, depending on the community you went to, some people were like, I hate Discuss, because in some cases, they just completely modify how it worked. And then somebody else would be like, I love it. Uh, it was kind of irritating. It was difficult for us to introduce new features because people were taking parts out and, and doing whatever. Like, so if we want to introduce a new feature, we couldn't always depend on what was there. We kind of worked around this idea that people were just kind of taking stuff out. And we do a lot of ifs and buts. Uh, really frustrating. Um, it was brittle, it was buggy, we had some security and privacy issues, so we'll just go over those a little bit more. So just to give you an idea of how, like, customization-wise, um, you know, what did Discuss look like, um, here's a screenshot from the MLB comments that use Discuss. Uh, you notice the word Discuss doesn't appear anywhere. That's just one example. Um, this is people.com, I think. Um, I think it's supposed to say Powered by Discuss in the corner, but it's like a broken image link, so nobody knows. Um, <laughs> And it looks completely different there. And then this is AV Club. Uh, they've taken some stuff away in the header, and, and it's different as well. Um, kind of annoying. So that just gives an idea of, like, of how it looked differently. So I'm talking about introducing new stuff. We were rendering elements. We were rendering comments on the DOM. We, we call them publishers, because I guess when we got started, a lot of people who use Discuss are like web publishers, like CNNs and stuff. So that's just like our internal you know, talk, a publisher, website person. Um, you can use CSS to hide stuff. Um, and even if, even if, you know, they couldn't target stuff with CSS, even if we were getting like super clever with CSS, they could always just remove it with JavaScript. So, you know, and you can do stuff to kind of like, you know, play this game, but anybody, it's on your DOM, you can traverse it, you can do whatever you want with it. It's really hard to stop people to do that. Um, so just to give you an idea, we got into like these CSS nuclear arms races where, We'd like really like over specify things with we'd use important tags everywhere. Um, we'd use double ID selectors because nobody uses double IDs. So <laughs> <laughs> and then it would be like and then somebody would be like, fine, well now we're gonna use triple IDs and then it was just you know, it was, it was getting really silly. <laughs> um, and that's how easy it was to just, you know, take stuff up. And I, like obviously some of the stuff we wanted people to, to customize, but then we kind of had like this global stuff that we didn't want anybody to change. We wanted everybody to like we wanted the login thing to look the same everywhere, so you knew how to log out or how to log in. That's the stuff that people would change. It was really irritating. So lastly, um, um, well not lastly. I'm sorry if this is like a lot of setup. I just want everyone to understand kind of what we're working with. I feel like this is a crazy story. We're running a lot of code on the on the host page on the publisher page. Um, a lot of people have messy JavaScript environments. It's like people talk about how like oh our our you know our code base has all these globals. It's gross. It's legacy. We have to deal with that at times like everybody's website, um, and it's really hard to predict what people are doing. Um, you'd often find yourself debugging CNN.com or whatever, and you'd find plugins or whatever. It might not even be them. It may be that they just you know they had another third party script, and we would all mess with each other and and just have fun. Um, so this is a this is a true to life example of, of something that we encountered where somebody decided to override a radar prototype of push. Um, I don't know what, what purpose they were serving. <laughs> they actually removed functionality because even though this works, like it's just pushing on top of the array, um, the actual array prototype of push takes multiple arguments. So you can push one, two, three, four, five values. So we had some code that did that and it broke. And that would just be the kind of thing we'd be debugging. I said. <laughs> Yeah, this is, this is, yeah, I would cry. Um, so, and so now this is the last thing. We also have privacy issues. And this is the thing that I don't think a lot of people understood. Um, and we didn't understood, understand for a while. But if you think about it, it's all about having this like global identity. And you go to different websites, and you can sign in and post. Um, but for us to do that, for you to, you know, to see, like, oh, I'm logged in here, and I'm over here, and I can post everywhere, we're, we're putting information about you on the DOM. We're not sharing like private information. 
but it's enough to identify you. Like it could be your name, it could be whatever. Um, and if you think about it, we're kind of sharing that as you browse the web. So to give you an idea, like here's here's like the old disgust, and here's me logged in, and I'm just kind of highlighted with my with my terrible Photoshop skills, like places where you can kind of gleam information about the visitor. So for example, I've written this post, and although you can't see post below it, it's highlighted in red. So um, I think that's that's not even something we did. I think that's a, like a, a tool that a, a publisher did. But you know, they could say, oh, this person is highlighted in red. Well, now I know the author is Ben Vinegar because, right, or whoever's visiting this page, it's red. Who's the author? It's Ben. You know, they could, you know, they could conceivably start collecting that information. Um, it's kind of scary stuff. Um, all right, a horror story. So. Um, I guess at the end of 2011, we had this idea. We were kind of getting tired of all this. It was very, you know, miserable, and um, this is not cool. So we had an idea. So which was, what if we took Discuss, <laughs> and we put everything in an iframe, just entirely. Um, we used iframes before. I know a lot of things about iframes, um, but we didn't use them like everything. We used them sparingly in places that that really need to be secure, um, like the post box itself would be an iframe because we didn't want people to like hijack the post box and write comments on your behalf and stuff like that. But now we're talking about taking everything. Um, so that, that's effectively what the project was. So um, <laughs> this diagram might explain <laughs> what, we were, what we were going for. <laughs> um, so just take like everything and put it in an iframe. So like, why would we do that? Um, and that's really because of the same origin policy, which is you know stuff on different origins can't access each other, that iframes as well. So we put this iframe, it's on discuss.com, Parent page can't you know mess with it. They can't find you know gleam any details about it. They can't inspect it. We're running in our own code environment completely. You never have to deal with you know messy parent JavaScript environments. Um, and I didn't really talk about cross-site scripting, but in the you know hypothetical you know what's the word I'm looking for? Let's say that there was a cross-site scripting vulnerability in our application. Okay. <laughs> Worst case, we could put that all over the web. We could put it on everybody's web page, and that's super bad. Um, in the iframe case, at least it's scoped to our iframe, um, and it's just us that's affected. And I prefer that, you know, like that's just a million times better. Um, and I'd like to think that nobody has cross-site scripting vulnerabilities, but the reality is that almost everybody does. I think there was a Google Finance one the other day. Um, even you know the biggest biggest websites, the biggest development firms have them nonstop. So um, we embarked on the grand rewrite, as Joel Spolsky has called it. Um, except not quite, because we just did the client side, client side codes. This is all JavaScript, basically, and like templates and that kind of stuff. We still had an API, so we had an API. It was pretty decent. We built on top of that. We didn't rebuild really very much server stuff, uh, and we made a decision that we were only going to do IE and up, which was a little contentious going back to 2011, because IE seven was still used a fair bit um, by our customers. Um, but the reason we did is that. I8 and up has a very critical feature for working with iframes, uh, window.post message. That's the thing, that's like the method that you use to communicate between iframes in a safe way. Um, there, are, there are tons of hacks to go back with older browsers, but now that we're in 2013, there's really no point in talking about them. Um, so there's just like a bit of a problem here, which is we were selling this product and <laughs> Like one of the big sells was that you could customize it. You could, do, you know, it was your thing. So, you know, as like product engineers, we're like, here's what we're gonna do. Here's the new version. It's totally awesome. We're gonna fix all this stuff. And then you talk to the business people, and they're like, what? So, it wasn't enough to just refactor it. We couldn't just refactor it. So we actually, you know, we were gonna take stuff away. We felt that to make it compelling, to make people want want to switch, we also had to add new stuff. Um, so we, we did brand new UI, we had designers crank out a new user interface. Um, we built a real-time system. Uh, we were gonna bring real-time comments to everybody for free, was the idea. Um, and, I, and you saw my, if you remember the quote from earlier, we do a lot of concurrent connections. That's what started here. Um, so, choosing a framework. Uh, spoiler alert. <laughs> I, won't, I won't spoil it. Um, so, now that we have like our own iframe, and we're like, okay, we, we control this thing from top to bottom uh, for the first time, which was <laughs> very exciting, and we wanted to use a framework. We just thought that we, we needed something. Uh, we're not good programmers. So, <laughs> but 
you know, like a lot of the stuff that's out there doesn't isn't necessarily fit what we're trying to do. Um, discuss as an iframe. There's no address bar. There's no permalinks. There's no. Do we really need a router? Uh, not really. You know, when you refresh the parent page, uh, the parent page doesn't remember the state of all the iframes and like restores them to some URL. That doesn't happen. Um, discuss is loaded repeatedly. A lot of like single page or kind of like a lot of backbone apps, Ember apps. You open them up and they kind of hang out there and you browse around and they stay. With us. You go, you know, you see Discuss everywhere. You're, you're loading it up, you're closing the tab, you're linking, you, you, you probably hit it a ton of times in a day. You may even load it multiple times on one page. Um, and then the last thing is that it's, it's actually like kind of short-lived, like, unless you're the kind of person who browses with 200 tabs open, then I know those types of people. Usually you don't keep Discuss open that often, or, or that long. So um, we really felt like Backbone, uh, we looked at Ember a lot. Um, this is the end of 20, 2011. We looked at Ember a lot, and we looked at, ba at Backbone, and we thought that, that Backbone would fit much better. Uh, we weren't 100% sure what it was going to look like in the end, but we, we just thought, you know, the lightness. I, there's a lot of arguments that are made about, like, Backbone doesn't do too much, and that's good. And um, for us, it was very, very good, because we didn't have that much. Um, the extensibility was important because we, were, we had some legacy stuff that we were bringing, some like old libraries, and, and maybe even some like newer non-traditional libraries that we thought Backbone would do a better job at. Just you know, looking at the code, looking at how everything fit together, uh, looked good. Um, and lastly, file size. I'm not like I'm not a file size guy. I don't think it's I don't think size matters that much, but um, I think that we have a different application in which you know. You go to a website and discuss gets served, and a lot. I think that we have a higher obligation than other websites to try and be as tight as we can. And maybe we're not the best, but you know we try. Um, so we felt that file size was a goal. We really wanted this to be the, the leanest thing that you could do. To that point, um, we don't use. We decided not to use jQuery with this. We decided to go. You know, um, jQuery is too mainstream for us. So we decided to try Ender. Um, which is like a collection of micro libraries. Um, it's kind of, it's, people aren't gonna like this, but it's a little defunct right now. Uh, but at the time it felt like really up and coming and it felt like it, it fit our needs very well. Like it came in at maybe like a fifth of the size of jQuery, um, probably did 70 or 80 percent, we thought that was enough. Um, and technically Backbone supports it, vis-a-vis -vis one line of code in which it just looks for Ender. Um, and that's in Backbone today. Um, doesn't mean it works. But uh, it will at least be initialized to use it. So, um, and then just finally, we did less in Bootstrap. So that may also be surprising. If you look at Discuss today, it is actually Bootstrap. Um, probably about 25% of it, or even less. It's, j it's like really the foundational stuff. But um, you know, we, we built off of that as well. So <coughs> stuff happened. Uh, we built this. We built all this in about six months. The first month was prototyping, and then we did four to five months, um, um, which I think is pretty fast. I don't know. Um, so we did this beta in May, and then we just released it in June. Um, for some reason, we called it Discuss 2012. Um, and there's a kind of a funny story behind that, which is that internally we called it Discuss Next. And you may or may not be aware, but Next is a very popular project name for companies. Um, there was SoundCloud next, and then Basecamp next came out, and all of a sudden, you know, calling your thing next didn't sound very, very sexy. And we ran out, of, and we ran out of ideas. And 2012 happened. Uh, I'm sure it was smarter than that, but uh, that's just a little backstory. Um, and now I'll regale you, I'll regale you with this video we made um, when it came out, so that you know what it, a little bit what it's like. Um, it's got like, I'll turn on this music. It's got like this, it's got like this, you know, Apple-y kind of like music thing going on in the back. You'd never believe that it works as good, but it kind of does. Uh, anywho. <laughs> oh man, move me. Didn't like videos very much. Um, so we did it. Um, that's basically what the video is trying to say. We actually built something. Um, and it works out pretty good. And what you see today is basically that project, and it's just been iterated on. And the, and the foundations of what, um, what we built then are just still cranking along. So now that I've got that very incredibly long intro uh, done, oh my god, it's been 25 minutes. Okay, so now that I got that, I just want to talk about sort of 
you know, technical hurdles we ran into and solutions, stuff we did with Backbone that I think are a little interesting and maybe a little, a little um, different. So first off, just want to talk a little bit about iframes. Um, how did that work out? Um, uh, it kind of solved everything that we thought it would set out to do, so that's pretty good. Um, it, it adds some pain points, though. Working with iframes is, you know, a little finicky. Talk a little bit about that. But actually, we also got some bonus stuff out of iframes that we didn't even plan for, which is really surprising. I'll, ta I'll, I'll talk about that really quickly uh, at the end. So what is painful about working with um, iframes as an embedded application? Basically, inside the iframe, just as the parent page can't access you, you can't access the parent page. So you don't know what's going on in the world around you. You don't, you, you don't know what events are happening on the outside. Um, you don't know if the viewport is changing, if you want to know where the viewport, it, viewport is because you want to defer load some stuff. Um, you don't know if the URL is changing, if there's push state happening, your document fragment, uh, stuff like that. But we do a post message, and the way that basically the application works is we have code running on the, on the parent page. Very little, I would say about 5%. And all that's doing is really relaying information about the parent page into the iframe. So it kind of looks like this. Oh, so just, just to really understand, like, why is this a problem? Let's say that this is droidlife.com. And let's say that you know, I open up this menu. Um, and now I want to close the menu by clicking away, because that's how applications just work. If I click somewhere else, I want to close the menu. Um, we don't know, like, unless we track events on the parent document and send that down, we don't know. The iframe has no idea if you click outside the iframe. So an early version of this is you just could never close this. Um, so that's the kind of stuff we would do. So just to, you know, if you're curious, just to show you how we did this, is on the parent document, we have some code. We'll have an event listener. We're looking for the click event. When it happens, we'll just, we'll just send a message using post message to the iframe and say, hey, click event happened. This is probably the absolute simplest thing uh, we do with this. Um, and this is, of course, like not the actual code. It's just kind of a simplified, um, you know, teaching kind of one. Um, the last parameter to post message, I don't know if any, has anybody, who's used post message here, just out of curiosity? Okay, 20%. Um, check it out on MDN. Um, it's pretty simple, you take, a, you take a window reference, you call post message, you give it a message. Um, it can be a string, it can be JSON in newer browsers. Um, and then the last parameter is just like a, a target origin, and that's so that the browser will only send the message to uh, like a domain that you expect. That's just a little security thing because uh, people can be quirky and you may think that you have a reference to a window but somebody could redirect it somewhere else that you don't like uh, anymore. So on the other side, now we're inside the iframe. We gotta know this click event is happening. Um, there's an on message event. So we just listen to the on message event and we're getting these messages down that we're sending. And you know, if if the clicked event happens, we do something. If the scroll event happens, we do something. If, if the hash change event happens, we do something. Um, this is just a really simplified version of that. So um, this is kind of like, it's not very nice. Um, and we decided to throw some backbone on it. Um, so we really like backbone. We, we like the API. We like the event-driven stuff. And we just, um, people have been talking about the um, events mixin. Uh, we put that event mix in on everything. So we put it on our messaging wrapper as well so that we can do you know, the life cycle events and everything about, about what's happening on the parent page just as you were like model changes or something. So if you want to write the easiest post message wrapper in the world, this is what it looks like. It is, we, we, we call this the messaging bus. Somebody talked about the messaging bus earlier. Um, and all it is is an empty object with backbone uh, or extended with backbone events. And then on the onMessage event, we just trigger something on that object. That's it. Um, works surprisingly well. Obviously, we do a lot, you know, some other stuff, but that's 80% that's of it right there. Um, so now, if you, if you have a view, um, here's like a, let's pretend this is a user menu. It's the user menu I showed you earlier. Um, when I initialize a view, I'm going to listen to the bus, and when I get that window click event, I'm going to close it. And that's just how it works. Um, it's just like if the model changed and you know, your name changed, you're going to do something as well. So uh, kind of neat, we get, to, we get to keep working within the backbone ecosystem, even though we kind of have this weird um, embedded way of doing things. Um, so one last bonus about iframes is we get to use this feature called content security policy. Um, how many people know about content security policy? Oh man, um, like 2%. Um, 
Content security policy is kind of like a bleeding edge feature. Bleeding edge feature. It's in Chrome and Firefox right now, but like very recently in Firefox. And it basically lets you define headers with your resources, like on a document, so that you can't execute, nobody can execute um, inline code. And that prevents attackers from injecting inline code because it won't execute. Um, so everybody can use it right now, and I recommend looking into it because um, it's a huge, huge mit mitigator for cross-site scripting attacks. Um, the upside for us is that now that we're in an iframe, we can just say, hey, the iframe can't execute any inline code, so nobody can inject anything. So if you're using a modern browser, you're actually prevented from like being affected by any cross-site scripting vulnerabilities. Uh, super cool. Um, I've been giving some talks about this um, over the last six months. Um, and there's a talk there if you want to check it out just to, to learn about it. Um, it's pretty neat. I think um, the, the n number of sites that are using this is extremely low. It's like Twitter and Discuss and GitHub. And I'm not even joking. It's like it's, it's that, that short of list. I keep asking more people if they're using it, but um, nobody gets back to me. So next thing that we deal with is a lot of instance wrangling. So we kind of have this uniqueness problem where we have a lot of different collections and models appear multiple times. I feel like probably everybody deals with this. Um, some models in our case are fresher than others. And when we want to change one model that represents like the same database backed object, we want it to update every other instance. Um, so to give you a quick example, let's pretend that this is this is posts in the discuss system. This is a collection of posts. I've got two posts. They're both written by me. Um, so there's sort of like a sub object here, which is author, um, and that's me. And I'm just complimenting my own article. So let's say that later, you know, after I got that data, I decide to log in as me. Um, but I've also like in the interim, since I made those posts, I decided to change my username. I'm, I I want to be called Ben Salt and Vinegar. Um, and so I, I, I request the session, and I get this newer data. Um, but on the post, I still have like the old display name. They don't sync up. And that's kind of how Backbone works out of the box right now. You, if you have you know, different, if you have the same database backed object in multiple collections, they'll be different instances. Um, so why does that matter? Like, how, how, why would that even happen? Like, why would I get, why would, when I fetch data that's me, why would it be, why would it be mismatched with you know, post data that came earlier. Um, there's plenty of reasons. A big, a big reason for us is that most of, the, most of the traffic that we get is like people who are logged out of Discuss. And a lot of it is also stale and doesn't change. So like a commenting thread from six months ago usually doesn't change very often. Um, it's, it's really heavily cached to the point where we, we even put entire commenting threads on a CDN. Um, so what we'll do is like if you change something about yourself and you visit an old thread and you just want to admire your old comment, um, we will augment that comment automatically with your, your freshest data. Um, so that's sort of a way that we deal with this. There's, there's, a bunch of, there's a whole bunch of other benefits, like you would just save memory if you have duplicate models and stuff like this, but this is something that's helpful for us. Um, we wrote um, a backbone plugin called Unique Model. I think there's a bunch out there. Um, what Unique Model does is we just, like, you, you wrap it around a class and it affects, like, it wraps the constructor. So whenever that model is created, whether it's in a collection, whether you do it, um, it's always unique. So um, this is a quick example if we went back. Like I created one instance um, with my old name and then I created a new instance with my second name. Um, the two instances would be identical. And we assume that any object that comes later is actually like the, newer, the newest record, so it updates as that. Um, so to extend on that, that's like, what if you have like the same instance in a single document? What if you have the same instance across multiple windows? Uh, wouldn't it be cool if you could synchronize data from one window to another? Um, so it's just like carrying this forward. Um, I, and this is affecting us because we're starting to do multiple iframes. Um, our application is spread around uh, just multiple windows, multiple iframes. So we've been experimenting this and taking that backbone plugin, unique model, and putting it on session storage and to synchronize data as they appear in different places. Um, I'm not going to go too deep into it, but if, if you check out the repo, I had this demo in uh, which to do MVC appears again. Um, and I've, I added, basically it includes this plugin. It adds two lines of code in which it just, um, it's literally just two lines of code. You can check out the repository. And then it does this, which is, this is four windows of to do MVC. 
and every modification that happens in one window automatically gets spread to the other. Um, at some point, I should go to the other window and show that it goes the other way. Am I going to do that? Nope. All right. Well, it does. <laughs> um, we don't do this yet. This is like really experimental for us, but um, we think it would be really cool. Um, so lastly, last thing I'm going to talk about um, is event proxies, just another pattern that we use. Um, we represent a session inside of Discuss, um, like the state of a session using distinct classes. When you first when we first load Discuss, we assume that you're an anonymous user, and that is the session. It's the session of an anonymous user. When you log in, now you are a completely different user. You are a full-fledged user. And if there's like a single sign-on integration, maybe you're a single sign-on user. Uh, why have different models? Uh, they each validate differently depending on if you want to post um, as that user type. So there's some, you know, we can test them individually. So there's some benefit to that. Um, so. Um, but there's just a bit of a problem here, which is, let's go back to my user menu. And let's say that as I initialize this user menu, I'm going to listen to the session object. And I'm going to say, hey, when you change, I'm just going to re-render the menu, right? Um, the user, like, I was logged out, now I'm logged in. i got to render, re-render that user menu to reflect the fact that now there's a user there. Um, but if the way that I log in is to just replace the session instance completely with a completely new object, um, my view is actually just like it's listening to a dangling reference that is no longer in the application, um, which is not good. Um, so the way that we've done that is we use a proxy model that wraps a user. So the session is, is a model. Um, you can bind to it. And it just kind of, it has, like it contains a user. And any events that trigger on the user event will just get propagated to the session. So. I bind to the session. I'm like, hey, if the session, if the username changes, the display name changes, re-render, it doesn't matter if the logged in state becomes a completely different user. Uh, it will totally work. I never have to do crazy cleanup or whatever. Um, and so that's been helpful for us. Um, and again, this is pseudocode. Um, maybe I wrote it and it, it totally works. Uh, I'll try that out later. So <laughs> um, I'll probably spin off that. that um, in, in, or the stuff that we actually use, I'll spin it off into a GIST or something, because I'm seeing a lot of nodding heads, and that seems cool. So um, today, um, this is now like just over a year later. This version has been out for a year. Um, obviously, I highlighted some like security concerns and privacy concerns, and probably when I showed that, people were like freaking out, like, oh my god. Um, the good news is that we we basically deprecated that version, and um, we're phasing it out today. Over 99%, it's probably like 99.9% of Discuss is using this newer secure version. Um, and we hope that soon that will be 100. Um, and even though we had all these crazy fears about like, no one want, would want to use Discuss if they couldn't customize it as you know. Um, and you can customize it a little bit, just not to the degree that you could before. Uh, like you just can't target whatever and, and change it. We've still managed to grow a colossal amount. Um, I think 50% when you're doing uh, billions of paid views is, is pretty big. Um, and just to show you what that, what that actually progression looked like, um, when we rolled it out in May, looked kind of like this. So blue is the new Discuss, or Discuss 2012, and red is the old one. Um, I think the number, this is not a presentation, I borrowed this from somebody else's presentation, but I think the number on the left is like daily total events, stuff that is happening, or stuff that we're logging. Um, so you can just kind of see how that's where it started, and by the time we get to the end, we've actually grown uh, significantly, completely with the new version. So I think that's pretty cool. Um, um, and then lastly, um, like I said, we're still iterating on that. We're still evolving it. We're trying to use more and more new stuff. Um, Mocha sign-on, I saw a lot of that today. Uh, we use that too, so that's pretty cool. We use handlebars, and we've been um, developing a grunt build process and stuff. And my last thing is that we actually got rid of Ender and uh, switched to jQuery. Uh, <laughs> uh, and that, that literally happened like in the last couple weeks, or I just finished in the last couple weeks. Um, that could probably be an entirely new talk or an entirely different talk. Um, but if anybody's curious, um, Ender just didn't really work out very well for us. I think um, I, I remember the summer of the microlibrary. Does anybody remember the, the summer of the microlibrary? Um, and although I think it had really good ideals, I, you know, 
it's hard. You just can't. I would bet on jQuery. It's just basically, you know, you can't. A lot of people have tried to say, like, I can build the 80% library of jQuery. And, and it's really, really hard. There's a reason why jQuery is where it is today. Um, with Ender, we were patching just a ton of stuff. You know, we used a, an Ajax library. Oh, this Ajax library doesn't support cores. OK, we've got to implement it. Um, um, the DOM API was just randomly broken, inconsistent in a bunch of places that people didn't think about, stuff like that. And we would spend a lot of time debugging Ender and not writing code, and that really depressed us. So that's what, what ultimately um, facilitated the change. Um, so, am I like super over, by the way, to start 30? Um, so just final thoughts. Um, I'm very big on iframes. Um, if, if you're doing Im embedded applications, um, obviously I highlighted a lot of reasons why you should explore to that. Um, I also think, you know, that is a little controversial, but there are other applications out there that worked in the way, that work today in the way that we used to work. Um, and I think people should be critical of that because um, they have a lot of issues, you know, privacy issues, security issues, et cetera. Um, that I think are kind of concerning. That's all. I'm not saying that you know we're awesome or anything, but I would like to see everybody move to the model of iframes. Iframes are not scary. They shouldn't be this like ridiculous thing that everybody is like, ooh, that's gross. Uh, they're actually pretty awesome, and they let us do a lot of cool things. So that's all I got. Um, clap. <laughs> So I'm, I'm going to do the shameless plug, which is that we're, we're hiring um, really badly. I'd love for some backbone people to join me uh, and discuss and work on backbone and reach a lot of people and stuff like that. Any questions for Ben? If uh, there weren't any, if you weren't showing any private data and there were no privacy concerns, which is not the case for you. Mm -hmm. um, would you still prefer iframes just because of the CSS conflict problems um, and, the, and the sort of the namespace problems? Well, well there's still a, there's still a security problem there, right? Even if you're if you're not showing like private data, you're probably showing some sort of user generated data, or at least a lot of people are. If you're not, then yeah. never mind. Um, I do know that there are like there are there are widget people out there who are building stuff without iframes because iframes are slow and they are they are inputting user data directly in the DOM that, you know, I think that's a problem as well. But um, the CSS angle or whatever, I, I mean, I say that, but you're right. It, it really matters on what you're trying to do. If you, if you are not, if you don't have, if you don't have user data and you don't have, you know, session kind of data, I think it's totally fine. Um, at that point, it's just how do you, how much do you want to suffer, like, in terms of being, um, you know, possible to be manipulated um, by another party. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, I was just wondering, firstly, uh, just very roughly, what sort of size is the, you know, the payload when you load a, a discus, like your application? Um, I'm trying to think off the top of my head. Um, I think that the the initial script that runs on the host page, I was looking at this the other day, is 12 kilobytes. So that's that's. That's what runs on the host page, just 12 kilobytes. And but I mean the application yeah, the yeah. script in the. I'm, I'm getting there. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I need an answer. Uh, yeah, I don't know. After we switched to jQuery, I know that we knew that this would be like this would be 20 more kilobytes. Can you handle that? And we were like, yes. Um, <laughs> um, probably like, uh, I think approach it like everything. Everything is probably approaching 300. I think. So uh, my follow-up question to that is, uh, you said that on on a single page, you'll, you might get multiple uh, embeds. Yeah. Do you have any way to avoid each of those embeds, including 300 kilobytes of download? I mean, well, the one upside is that you, you'd be requesting the exact same asset, and the browser won't download it, right? Yeah. Um, I mean, it's still a lot of code. Um, we actually. It has to be passed three, four, five times. Yeah. Um, there would be the possibility of that. Like you could imagine, like if we downloaded the co code as an XHR bundle and then we passed it to an empty iframe and executed it there. That would be really cool. Um, the thing is, uh, that that could be okay. Um, one thing that we're really, <laughs> um, I mean, this is also like a fringe case. You know, 
almost never see that, so it's not really something we think about too much. But it was a thought. Um, and we do open, like, uh, we do a profile modal now. Um, so if you click on somebody's face, you're going to see a modal pop up. That's actually a full screen iframe, which is a really cool effect um, that I'd love, I would love to talk on another time. Um, it, you can't tell that it's an iframe, but it just like it overlays the whole thing. It's really neat. Um, and that could be something. Um, one thing that we try to do is, because of this privacy thing, we, we, don't put, we don't transfer anything on the parent page, anything even remotely private. No user data, no anything. So um, if we want to transfer data from one thing to another, it's through session storage, or we just request again. Um, I don't know. That's sort of a kind of an answer. Yeah. Cool. Thanks. I got anything else for Ben? He said breathing into the microphone. Nothing? All right. Cool. Thank you.